So once again, welcome to our weekly Dharma talk here at Dharmata. One, uh, one o'clock, second lifetime, every Monday. For those who don't know, today's talk is called Buddhist Hermeneutics and the Problem of Tradition. It's not a long talk, probably about 40 minutes. Well, now we'll fill up the hour. So feel free to interrupt any time if you have any questions, comments, or discussion as we go along. And I'll endeavor to answer any questions as best I can. For those, uh, anyone uh, who is not familiar with the meaning of the word hermeneutics, it is the study of uh, interpretation, specifically the interpretation of sacred texts. So Buddhist hermeneutics from the Greek, uh, you can. Generally, it's better to put them in the chat, in my experience, because sometimes a lot of people in voice, sometimes it gets sort of, uh, cacophonous, but uh, there's no rule against it. But I, personally, I think I think that uh, it's more efficient to just put it in the chat. Plus, you can always give you the, putting things in chat. I find gives you just an extra few seconds to think about what you're saying or asking, if, so that things tend to be somewhat better phrased when they're in chat too. So Buddhist Buddhist hermeneutics from the Greek hermeneutikos which means of or for interpreting, commonly but erroneously associated with the Greek god Hermes, the messenger of the gods, is still in its infancy in the West, as the Dharma transmission to the West, now in its 108th year, continues to take hold and proliferate. The most common Buddhist hermeneutic, especially amongst both traditional and modern Tarawadins, is historicism. Also academics tend to that direction as well especially Western academics. Uh, that is the belief that the meaning of the Buddhist message is identical with the words uttered by Siddhartha Gautama, Siddhartha Gautama who lived between approximately, uh, uh, four, or uh, who was enlightened rather, between approximately 445 and 400 before the Common Era, the historical Buddha. Although this hermeneutic may seem to many to be straightforward and self-evident, Critical evaluation reveals it to involve numerous problems, including one, objective identification of the actual historical words of the Buddha, the so-called Buddha Vachana. Two, determination of the correct meanings of the words <coughs> and the doctrines that they imply. Three, resolution of apparent contradictions. Four, Resolution of apparent nonsense, including the problem of what nonsense actually is in the context of cultural relativism. That is, what may be nonsense to you may not be nonsense to me, and vice versa. And what may have been nonsense, what may be nonsense to us may not have been nonsense 2,500 years ago. And finally, the question of whether the Buddha Vachana is comprehensive, complete, and exclusive, even if it is accurate and true. I'll put those points in the chat. These problems occur against a religious backdrop that tends to hold influenced by the Buddhist doctrine of the degenerate age, that later equals bad. You find this all the time. Thus disparaging later texts as inherently non-historical and dubious, even within the canonical tradition of the Pali Canon itself. This kind of analytical necrotizing fasciitis threatens to devolve into nihilism. We've had some discussions on nihilism in previous talks as well. The latter also represents a decisive break with orthodox Theravada, even though many people who criticize the Pali Canon in this way hold themselves out to be Theravadin. The orthodox Theravada, which still has numerous adherents both in Asia and in the West, holds that the Pali texts of the Pali Canon, including the Vinaya, the Suttas, and the Abhidhamma, all incorporate the exact words used by Siddhartha Gautama in the language spoken by the Buddha, remembered preeminently by Ananda, who was graced with the gift of photographic memory and verified by the arhats of the first Buddhist council and their successors, who were perfect and infallible in their understanding of the Dharma. This is, of course, a line of reasoning we're familiar with. Uh, 
I say we, those of us who are Westerners, uh, in our own Judeo-Christian tradition. Thus, the collective text of the Pali Canon is the literal Buddha Vachana, handed down without error for 2,500 years. We in the West are, of course, familiar with such thinking amongst Jews and Christians. The Bible is the literal inspired word of Yahweh, or the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And Muslims, the Quran is the literal word of Allah, dictated to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel, and preserved through an impeccable process of collation, after which all deviant texts were destroyed, etc., etc., etc. However, even if we accept the orthodox premise, the problem of hermeneutics is not yet solved. There is still the problem of interpreting the meaning of the language, of the infallibly revealed scriptures and doctrines, and the questions of whether these meanings are complete and comprehensive, and whether the texts themselves exhaust all possible meanings, therefore illegitimizing any subsequent interpretation. A lot of academic and scholarly effort has been put into the Pali Canon in the past hundred years, thanks to the pioneering efforts of F. Max Muller, Rice Davids, and his spouse, and the Rice Davidses, really, technically, and others. Although there are extremists who deny any legitimacy to the Pali Canon, the general consensus today is that the Pali Canon, especially the four great Nikayas, so-called, the Diga, Majima, Sangyuta, and Anguttara, represent the historically oldest strata of the Buddhist scriptures, and are probably substantially similar to the books that were compiled in the first century before the Common Era, 300 years after the death of the Buddha, give or take, even though we have few texts actually dating from that period due to the perishable nature of the writing materials that were used. This has led some denialists to reject the Pali Canon tradition entirely as the invention of Western Orientalists. I've actually been told that by a Tibetan Buddhist monastic that the Pali Canon is a complete invention, an unlikely proposition. It might even be true that these texts are substantially similar to the texts as they appeared in the mid-3rd century before the Common Era, about 150 years after the Buddha's death, which corresponds, of course, to the period uh, of the, the reign of King Ashoka, during whose reign Buddhism was, uh, there was a major move to, sta to, to standardize Buddhism uh, during his reign. For comparison, this corresponds to the Christian literature between 180 and 380 of the Common Era, none of which is canonical. On the other hand, the Pali Canon has the virtues of repetition and size, so that it is possible to identify recurrent themes in the texts that were presumably emphasized in the original teachings. However, even here there is controversy. The important Polish, Polish Buddhologist, Stanislaw Scher, undeservedly little known in the West, opined that the exceptional, contrary, and idiosyncratic material that was left in the Pali Canon may even be more significant than the stock doctrines precisely because they were left in the Canon by its conservative redactors. Why put, leave something in the Canon if it's not consistent with your own views and you're a conservative unless it had a lot of authority behind it. An interesting contrarian uh, notion. Unfortunately, none of his books, as far as I know, have been translated into English. By emphasizing these teachings, Scheer arrives at a proto-Mahayanist view that contradicts the mainstream view that still regards the Theravada uh, as the most historically authentic school. Based on the current consensus of the dates of the Buddha, called the Median Chronology, which places his passing on, or Parinibbana, about 400 before the Common Era. And Graza McCullen, McCullen asks, all those transcripts were lost with the language barrier, right? Um, you're, uh, uh, I'm not ex exactly sure what you're referring to. What, you mean the early texts? The very earliest Buddhist texts, the physical the earliest physical Buddhist texts. There was no writing at the time of the Buddha, of course. Uh, it was not, uh, the, they didn't have write the materials. Uh, Pali was an oral tradition initially, and uh, written materials began to appear during the time of King Ashoka, which is the mid-3rd century. The Buddha died, according to the modern chronology that I follow, 
about 400 before the Common Era. So the Ashoka uh, converted to Buddhism around the mid-third century, so that's 150 years. And uh, those first Buddhist writings were actually inscribed in stone, uh, the so-called pillars of Ashoka, uh, of the number of which I've slipped my mind. But he put them all over, he positioned them all over uh, India, what we call now call India, uh, to advertise his uh, conversion to Buddhism and also the begin to begin the process of, con of documenting Buddhist teachings. And so those were the first Buddhist writings. And then around the first century before the Common Era, so now we're talking around 90 BC, approximately 100, say it's 100, so 300 years, um, the, the, the Pali Canon was written down in its entirety. Uh, because of a famine, and they were afraid that the Buddhist monks were afraid that the uh, teachings might be lost. And those are the first Buddhist teachings, the first Buddhist writings. And they were written on, um, I want to say banana leaves, but it's not banana leaves. It's a kind of plant leaf, palm leaf, palm leaf manuscripts. Uh, yes, parchment, parchment, palm leaf. Um, some very small amounts of that have survived, um, but however, they, Ashoka did send out uh, these texts uh, to neighboring countries, and so they were eventually tra they were translated into Tibetan, they were translated into Chinese, and, sans and also they existed in Sanskrit as well. And because uh, even though we don't have the original necessarily have the original texts. We have early texts from mul in multiple translations and in multiple cultural traditions, which are all very similar to each other. So even though we may not have the actual physical documents, we, uh, the process of comparison and collation uh, has led scholars to the belief that the early texts are uh, fairly accurate rep reproductions of at least the original written tradition. What went happened during the oral period is anyone's guess. Uh, one can imagine that the, uh, the, Buddhist te the Buddhist teachings were rehearsed, and then over time they were consolidated. Uh, they were, you can tell from the texts themselves that they were repeated, cons consolidated, simplified into stock phrases, and um, then eventually written down. So it was a process, a, a process of oral transmission which began with remembering, uh, remembering material and then went through an editorial process which eventually resulted in the written text. Uh, Grasa Makhalan says, over the course of many years the actual meaning could have been lost a little. That's fair to say, very fair. That is very fair to say. And even the texts, even if we accept these early texts, uh, their interpretation is a matter of, of, of uh, consideration as well which is, of course, the subject of today's talk. Uh, let me just see where I was. So these texts were passed down orally for about 300 years before being committed to writing, although some parts of some texts may have been written down as early as the 5th century BC. Uh, the Ashoka does refer to books in his stone pillar inscriptions, uh, the, the identification of which is somewhat ambiguous. They, they, are, they are both similar to texts in the uh, Pali Canon and different from them. However, uh, in the course of these talks, we have become aware of the work of Hajime Nakamura, which you'll hear about in future talks, uh, Gaza, if you choose to continue to come here. And um, oh, I've lost my train of thought. What was I about to say? Sorry, my, just, my mind just went blank. What was I talking about? Never mind, it'll come back to me. The, the, uh, you were talking about the past literature, I know. Sorry, I, just, I was going to make a very specific point, and I've, I've got, it's gone right out of my head. Sorry about that. Um, you know, it may come to me. Oh, the, origi the original books that Ashoka mentions are similar to and different from uh, texts in the Pali Canon. So, it's, uh, so it seems like the earliest, earliest collections, ah, I remember what I was going to say. It seems like the earliest collections 
uh, may not be completely identical with the pellet cannon, but as a result of study, uh, the work that we've uh, recently discovered, the, uh, the work of uh, the noted Japanese scholar Hajime Nakamura, uh, there is a text which he thinks, and he, and he is a very significant scholar of Buddhism, translated the entire Pali Canon into Japanese himself, something that took the Pali Text Society several decades to do with a team of, re, of uh, translators. Uh, there's one text uh, in the Sudanipata which he suggests it may actually have been circulating during the, per period, during the life of the Buddha. So some of these are, at least that text and possibly others, are, are, may be very early indeed, including even contemporaneous with the Buddha. And that's the only text I've heard anyone say that about. And we, we, will be, we do have a talk on that text as well, uh, which will be repeated uh, in the coming months. So um, these texts were passed on orally for about 300 years before being committed to writing, although some parts of some texts may have been written down as early as the third century before the Common Era, which is Ashoka. The four Nikayas consist of several thousand suttas, or discourses, mostly attributed to the Buddha, purportedly delivered over the course of 45 years after his enlightenment experience, that is from age 35 to 80. These include places, names of the interlocutors, and sometimes evidential information concerning the relative dates of the discourses. However, this information is highly dubious given two passages in the Vinaya that describe a process of arbitrarily assigning places to suttas for which places were not known, and discrepancies of places and people involved in discourses that are very similar or even identical. Of course, it is also possible that the Buddha gave the same or similar discourses in different places, especially during the last years of his teaching career. On the other hand, the doctrinal significance of such differences is negligible. So on the one hand, you have differences. On the other hand, those differences aren't really that important. Play, details of uh, place and participants are not really of much doctrinal significance. And Grasa McCullen says this is very similar to how the Freemasons now integrate their religion belief into society. The Freemasons were uh, ones stonemasons, and they wrote on stone. They are, the, the, the Freemasonic approach is syncretic and eclectic, which uh, I actually appreciate. Uh, that's basically my approach to Buddhism as well. Um, if you're interested in Freemasonry, you might also be interested in some of the talks we have over at the Gnostic Sanctuary, where we have talks in that vein as well. Uh, in English translation, the four Nikayas constitute about 6,000 pages, or 2 million words, give or take. This corresponds to roughly 250 hours of speech, about five hours for each year that the Buddha reportedly taught. These are rough approximations. The suttas represent the Buddha as engaged in a virtually continuous process of communication with monastics, lay followers, and interested visitors based on a dialogic uh, question and answer process. Clearly, if this is true, five hours per year does not come close to what the Buddha must actually have said, even allowing for repetitions, which also occur in the Pali Suttas themselves, so these cancel out. Even if we cautiously assume that the Buddha spoke for two hours per day, two days per week, uh, which is very uh, conservative, his actual speech must have been nearly 50 times this. Thus, it seems that the view of the Dharma Guptaka a sect of the Hinayana, an early Buddhist school, which flourished about 232 before the Common Era, that the original teachings of the Buddha have been lost, is justified, at least in part. It has also been pointed out that many of the passages in the Pali Canon pertaining to the major doctrines are merely lists of headings. The doctrines themselves are not explained in any detail. Thus, a great range of interpretations is still possible. Most scholars today do not believe that the Pali language in which the Pali Canon is preserved is the actual language of the historical Buddha. Rather, Pali appears to have been an artificial language, hybridizing several Prakrit dialects, 
or vernacular dialects, common dialects, constructed after the fact in order to address the increasing linguistic and geographic diversity of the Buddhist community, or Sangha, that originated in Western India during the 3rd century BCE, the common era. So the fact that the Pali Canon was written in Pali already shows that Buddhism has become fairly extensive and geographically, linguistically, and therefore also culturally diversified. On the other hand, it seems likely that Pali was similar to the language or languages that the Buddha actually spoke. Thus, uh, or sorry, thanks to the Herculean efforts of the Pali Text Society, especially the Pali English Dictionary, which was uh, pu uh, published between 1921 and 1925, and I, is online as well, I believe, although you, know, you can get it. If you're actually seriously interested in Buddhism, I strongly recommend getting the Pali English Dictionary. It's only about $25, and it's exceptionally, it's amazing. It's one of those Victorian um, reference works that just boggles the mind how, how uh, thorough and, uh, and comprehensive and extensive the research is. Archive.org, indeed. Uh, in fact, I think it probably is on archive.org. Uh, so Pali is uh, fairly well understood, uh, thanks to those efforts, though more comparative and historical studies of the vocabulary as used throughout the canon need to be done and are now possible using computer analysis. We also need a good critical edition of the Pali canon, which right now exists in several different editions. I'm talking about the original. Uh, Pali and Sanskrit also draw on a common set of etymological roots in Vedic Proto-Sanskrit, the study of which greatly facilitates interpretation and translation. Peter Macefield has complained, however, a Buddhist uh, writer that I admire, that Pali translators are insufficiently attentive to the technical philosophical meanings of the words. The state of knowledge in this area has been nicely summarized by Bhikkhus Sujito and Brahmali in their monograph on this topic entitled The Authenticity of the Early Buddhist Text, published by Kronecker Press. Rice, Davids, and Pandi, who wrote Studies of the Origins of Buddhism, have also made significant contributions. Sujito and Brahmali appear to adhere to the revisionist Theravada school, sometimes called modern Theravada, also known as progressive Theravada, early Buddhism, or original Buddhism, somewhat preposterously, given that Theravada is actually a revival. Uh, the main conclusion of this study that is relevant to the present discussion is that the early Buddhist texts, or EBTs, which they identify generally with the four great Nikayas and some other texts, including the Vinaya Disciplinary Code, the Padamukha, parts of the Suddhanipata, which I've already mentioned, the Udana, Idhivotaka, Dhammapada, Teragata, and Terigata are authentic. And we've added to that list now, there's another, uh, I have another talk in which I've identified 25 texts, which are relatively uh, early. Their general argument is that the description of the political geography, social conditions, economic conditions and trade, and religious context accurately correspond to the period during which the Buddha lived and taught. That the oral textual transmission is both reliable and datable. That the remarkable vision and consistency of the canon, including peculiarities that can only be explained historically, is evidence of a unitary founder who was a real historical person, that archaeological research supports the antiquity and accuracy of the Pali Canon and the re reality of the Buddha, and that a comparison of later and earlier strata of the Canon shows an ideological development typical of other religions, based on which they attempt to reverse engineer, quote unquote, original Buddhism. The whole tenor of Sujito and Brahmali's argument consists of general assertions of this kind, such specific passages as they adduce having little or no doctrinal significance. However, even if we grant the veracity of this argument, it comes nowhere near proving their main thesis, their theory of authenticity, that is, quote, the texts that purport to be the words of the historical Buddha and his immediate disciples were in fact spoken by them, quote, unquote. Now, although their language largely, largely finesses this point, 
If their argument is that the words contained in these texts accurately preserve the actual words of the historical Buddha, and not merely the general situation, this conclusion is far too specific to be supported by the evidence that they adduce. Perhaps it would be fair to say then that the Pali Canon preserves an overview or outline of the major doctrines of the historical Buddha as interpreted by his successors and preserved as they were perceived and understood roughly 150 to 300 years after the Buddha's death. I believe Bhikkhu Bodhi has made the point more correctly when he states that the Pali Canon may include passages that resemble certain statements originally made by the Buddha. The problem then becomes how to identify and extract the utterances of the Buddha, such as they are, from the mass of material in which they are embedded, or if this is even possible. Some Pali linguists would like to suggest that the strict application of a scientific methodology of Pali linguistics to the Pali canon, in combination with other critical methods, could identify such passages. However, in practice one finds that such academics tend to find what they want to find, merely constructing an explanatory framework that justifies after the fact, their own particular ideological cultural view. My first pr 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 Buddhist professor, Sri Lankan, was very much like in this vein. A prominent example of this uh, that comes to mind. Oh, here we are. Here we are. I mentioned. I actually mentioned him. Comes is the work of University of Toronto professor, now retired, Sawanda H. J. Sugunasiri. One can, of course, connect the dots to justify any particular theory in retrospect, or almost any particular theory, simply rejecting passages as late, a very a great a favorite, or using other criteria, for example, Indian or Hindu, that do not conform to one's preferred interpretation, based on the fallacy already alluded to that late equals bad. Academics frequently fall into this hole. Let us look at this hermeneutical doctrine in detail since it is actually the one you will most fi find most prevalently. The assertion that late equals bad is based on two premises. First, that everything that is true about the Buddha's teachings was said by the Buddha himself and perhaps his immediate disciples. And two, that no doctrinal development is possible or permissible. That is to say that the Buddha's teachings are comprehensive, complete, and exclusive. Therefore, all that is necessary is to identify the original teachings. However, I have already shown that it is extremely improbable that the Pali Canon preserves all of the original teachings of the Buddha, or that it is impossible, even possible to identify the actual words of the Buddha. What we have is a composite of what the Buddha said, what his immediate disciples understood him to mean, and what their successors understood them all to mean, all inextricably interwoven together into an aggregate of texts some earlier, some later, some a mixture of earlier and later, and some of indeterminate earliness or lateness, and all embedded in a particular cultural system or systems. Moreover, it is clear that the Pali tradition moved gradually over time after the Buddha's death, first from northeast to western India, and then south to Sri Lanka, thus exposing it to a variety of cultural influences. If one's objective were to identify actually and objectively the precise technical language used by the historical Buddha, on which alone precise hermeneutical interpretations could be based, I would submit that this state of affairs is so complex and so ineffable that it is, practically speaking, impossible to sort out in an analytical or reductionist way, leaving us with a non-exclusive general outline theory at best. Moreover, even if we accept that we can identify a broad outline, perhaps even uh, uh, most of the original teachings of the historical Buddha, does this mean, one, that we have actually understood what the Buddha meant by those, these, those teachings, and two, or two, that those meanings are incapable of further understanding through a process of progressive examination, refinement, elucidation, and realization? With respect to the first point, the whole tenor of this discussion so far has been focused on the person of the historical Buddha. This bias corresponds to the use of the English word Buddhism, literally the doctrine of the one who understands. 
However, if we accept the Pali text, the actual word used by the Buddha to refer to his philosophy is Dharma Vinaya, literally a, a composite word, literally truth and training, which might be interpreted as training in the truth. That is more or less what we might mean by education or praxis of being. Elsewhere, he also refers to his followers as sons of the Shakyan, referring to Shakya, the Buddha's home country. It is quite clear, however, that the Buddha's object of concern was not himself, but rather the Dharma or truth itself in its most general and universal meaning, that is, the truth of being or reality, which he discussed and debated with his contemporaries, not merely as personal opinions, but rather as an objective reality that can be discussed, known, understood, and realized both by individuals and collectively through a critical process. The Buddha did not merely discuss the Dharma with his disciples. If we accept the Buddha as the Buddha, then we accept him as the supreme expositor of this truth, at least when and where he lived. But there is no suggestion in the Pali texts themselves that the Buddha's realization was personal, exclusive, or arbitrary in any sense. He also discussed it with other samanas, with whom he shared the desire to comprehend uh, his, uh, with whom he shared the desire to comprehend and realize his truth, even though they were not Buddhists. And in fact, again, our discovery of the work of, of uh, Hajime Nakamura on the early Buddhist, uh, on early Buddhism, and even original Buddhism, uh, is, is uh, gives and, and, and support to this view. Uh, therefore, this truth is objective. In other words, this is not a sect. In fact, it was sectarianism that he was rejecting in Brahmanism. His doing so implies that he believed that it was possible for him and them to come to a shared understanding of the Dharma. And like I said, Hajime Nakamura makes it very clear the indebtedness of early Buddhism to the sects that surrounded it. At least initially, it was not sharply distinguished from other, the teachings of other samanas although it was distinguished to some extent. His primary purpose was not merely conversion or persuasion, but shared understanding. Although, of course, by declaring himself Buddha, he was also implying that his realization was superlative. And once again, the insight of Hajime Nakamura come, uh, uh, come up, where uh, Hajime Nakamura also points out that the Buddha, as we, that Siddhartha Gautama, the man that we call the Buddha, uh, the historical Buddha, was not the only leader of Buddhism, as uh, quote, uh, in, in quotes, because we're using it's an English word, but he was not, the Buddha was not the only leader of Buddhism at that time. There are others, like Devadatta, who were also regarded as, and presumably others as well, who were also regarded as uh, leaders of uh, what we might call the Buddhist movement at that time. And so this unitary uh, emph uh, emphasis that we tend to superimpose on early Buddhism is not, is not actually historical. Here we depart decisively from mere academic scholarship, which is only concerned with establishing the facts of the matter, generally in historicist and social contexts. As Buddhists, our primary focus is, or should be, not merely to understand the Buddha, but also through understanding the Buddha to understand the Dharma. Uh, Gratza says it's current also. It's not only historical. Absolutely. I agree with that totally. Um, as Buddhists, our primary focus is it should be not merely to understand the Buddha, but also through understanding the Buddha to understand the Dharma. Thus, we have Dharmic and non-Dharmic or profane scholarship. While the latter may have utility to us as Buddhists, only the former is a fundamental or ultimate concern. This raises many additional and subtle questions and concerns that go far beyond mere academic or profane scholarship. Can we understand the Dharma entirely and exclusively by understanding the person of the Buddha? Even the Buddha is ultimately merely an historically and culturally contingent phenomenon. Is the Dharma something that is fixed or frozen in time, identical with the original words of the Buddha that we seek to discover in the Pali Canon? Is the Buddha even historical, or sorry, is the Dharma even historical? Is the Buddha the sole authority for understanding the Dharma? 
if the Dharma can be understood by his successors, and the Buddha's teaching career makes no sense otherwise, then there must be successors who are also authorities, perhaps even Buddhas themselves, whose utterances are therefore also relevant to understanding Buddhism, perhaps even more relevant than the Pali Canon, given its obscurity. If the Buddha has successors, then he may have had predecessors. There is no suggestion in the Pali Canon that the Buddha claimed to be unique. Rather, again, if we accept the relevant texts, the Buddha stated that he was merely rediscovering an ancient truth, known to but long forgotten by the Brahmins, and perhaps others too. This provides additional contexts for understanding the Dharma that go beyond the place, time, and historical and cultural circumstances of the Buddha. Ultimately, Dharma is the truth of reality itself. Therefore, it cannot be separated from any other form of knowing. As the truth of reality, it must be universal and implicit in all. Since reality is boundless and indeterminate, it seems extremely improbable that the Pali Canon encodes or could encode the totality of Dharma. Therefore, how can we restrict ourselves to it as anything other than a provisional foundation for further elaborations and exegesis, potentially even limitless in extent? And that does conclude my talk for today. Any comment before we conclude with the dedication of merit, whereby we dedicate the merit of this talk to all beings? Does anyone have any comments, questions, discussion? Yos Yospe says, listening to this presentation, it seems more and more likely that the well-known quote-unquote Buddhism actually may be the very superficial outlines Buddha taught, while, while opposite to the common known doctrine, the more deep doctrines may actually have been taught to a small group of initiates who... Um, sorry, my, my chat just disappeared off my screen. Uh, a small group of initiates uh, and could have remained hidden from the main view. Um, there are Buddhists who hold that view, uh, particularly in the Mahayana and uh, Vajrayana. Um, uh, divisions of Buddhism. Um, if, we, if we take the pa uh, Pali, uh, it's, I mean, it's certainly a possibility. Uh, if you take the Pali Canon as your authority, uh, there is a, there is a passage which is often t interpreted to refute this view, in which the Buddha said that he did not. Towards the end of his life, he said that basically um, he has not taught with the with the grip, I'm paraphrasing, but he is not taught uh, with the, the with the closed grip of a guru, i.e., holding holding uh, higher teachings or secret teachings back from um, his followers. Uh, this is, of course, a common trope that one finds in Hinduism uh, and presumably in Brahmanism as well, where gurus hold back teachings from uh, their uh, lesser disciples, I suppose you could put it that way. The Buddha said he did not do this. However, there's another passage, and this is often cited by the Theravadins in defense of their somewhat fundamentalist approach to Buddhism. However, the Buddha also says, and we can't pick, if we're going to choose one passage, we can't ignore another, uh, that uh, he compares uh, the, the uh, Dharma to a, a, a forest of samsap, samsa, samsapa trees, trees, which are known for their, uh, their uh, extensive foliage. And he grabbed a leaf or a handful of leaves, I think it was a handful of leaves, there's a sutta on this, of, the, of leaves and says, the Dharma that I have taught you is like this handful of leaves compared to the totality of the forest. So that implies that there are teachings beyond what he taught. Um, my interpretation of consolidating these two references, my interpretation of that is that the Buddha taught everything. Uh, taught every, uh, he, uh, he, he did not practice. He did not hold teachings back. But at the same time, the Dharma itself, being the truth of everything is far more extensive than anything that was or could be taught 
in any finite context. So I'm both, I guess I'm both agreeing and disagreeing with that, uh, the, that the view you see, you summarize Yas. Plus, on top of that, you have the additional realization that if Buddhism has any value at all, that it obviously has the, um, the capacity to lead people to enlightenment. Otherwise, what's the point of it? And if it has the capacity to lead people to enlightenment, then there must have been successors to the Buddha who were actually enlightened, and therefore, as I mentioned in the talk, authorities in their own right. So there is the possibility of a, of a progressive development of Buddhism, uh, which is still Buddhism, uh, even though it may not necessarily be identical with the original sources, which is, which is basically, the, I, I suppose, an, uh, an educated Mahayana view, which is my view. Um, I think there were some other things in here. Let me just see what's in the chat. Grazza or Grazza McCullen says, very similar to us, Freemason is a step process, and like you mentioned, you also interpret a hidden hand at work. Yeah, it is. Uh, and of course, uh, Freemason, I keep finding, to particularly in the context of Tibetan Buddhism, I find a lot of similarity to Freemasonry in the Tibetan system. And as you say, uh, the Freemasonry has a grade system. And uh, even in the, in the Pali Canon, the Buddha did make uh, distinctions between people. And he did have something sort of similar to grades. He had um, people who were known in both the, the, the male and female Sangha as the best in different categories. And there were specific, like, almost like offices. And... Uh, they, uh, he, he identified people. He named people who had been identified as the as the leaders in different of of, of the of, uh, in the Buddha Sangha in certain categories, like the most advanced in psychic powers, the most advanced in wisdom, the most advanced in asceticism, etc., etc., etc. There's a list, which is sort of like a grade structure or a hierarchy as well. Persona says. In original Buddhism, like in original Christianity, I would expect the teachings to be very simple. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, remember that, uh, from our perspective, 5th century BCE is an earlier stage of civilization, but it's still a very a late stage of Vedic civilization based on the, the, uh, the Vedas, and then the Upanishads, and then the Samanas. And it had a very, it had, there were a lot of different schools, a lot of different philosophical schools, a lot of philosophical discussion. Uh, and it was a very, it was a very advanced, developed, and sophisticated culture. So I'm not sure I agree with that, that we would necessarily assume that the original teachings of Buddhism are, are quote unquote, very simple. Yas says that it's a step process, and you can't do some steps before having ascended enough. True. Yas Yaspa says, early Christianity is just as vague as what this presentation on the Buddhist words describes. I think early Christianity actually is far vaguer than Buddhism, partly because of the lack of materials. The teachings of uh, Yeshua uh, occupy about 300 pages. The teachings of the Buddha occupy about 40 volumes. Yesha also originated from Galilee, which was a, um, a, 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 I think, a much simpler culture, intellectually, philosophically, spiritually, than, as I mentioned already, than fifth, Northeast India in, in the 5th century BCE. So I, my suspicion is that the teachings of, of Jesus are, uh, are, are much simpler than the teachings of the Buddha for those reasons. But of course, over time, simple teachings, axiomatic teachings developed and grew and understanding of them deepened and proliferated. And so they become, the, 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 it becomes more and more complex and more and more sophisticated over time, which is not a bad thing. Uh, understanding grows and develops over time. 
Yas Yaspa, BBC documentary on YouTube, Jesus is a Buddhist. That, that is a theory, which we won't get into today. There may have been a Buddhist influence uh, on uh, Christianity. Uh, when Ashoka, in the, around 250, when Ashoka converted to Buddhism, he sent emissaries out uh, in all directions uh, with the te which the to, to, to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha. They traveled east and, set, and established the seeds of Buddhism in, in uh, China and Southeast Asia and ultimately in Japan. And they also traveled west. And they reached, we know they reached Greece, uh, where, they, where they had an influence in Greek philosophy. I think they called the Therapeutai, where Buddhist influenced. Buddhism also influenced later Christian monasticism. And they re also reached Alexandria in Egypt. And I believe I have seen a reference to that someone actually reached Rome. And if they reached Rome, then they reached, Ga possibly, I'm not saying they did, but potentially they could have reached Galilee, which was known, which was looked down upon uh, by the Orthodox Jews of Jerusalem um, as a place of, of heresies. It was a place of ec ecstatic, charismatic, rabbinical uh, heretical, uh, or uh, at least a non-Orthodox Jewish culture, and it was known for its foreign influences. So it's possible that Buddhism influenced Jesus as well. Uh, let's see what else is there in the chat. Okay, I don't see anything else to comment on. Yas would like to plug his talk for tomorrow, plug away, especially since we've got some new blood. Um, is there Buddhist Dharma in A.A. A. Bailey's Modern Esoterica? Alice Ann, a. Alice Ann Bailey, A.A.B., proponent of the Back to Blavatsky movement in the Theosophical Society, wrote 24 esoteric books. Between 1919 and 1949, she is seen as a channel which was used by the Tibetan who, t who inspired her to write many of the mentioned books. This is the first of several talks on AAB's esoterica. Is there any of the Buddhist teaching, the Buddhist Dharma in these works? At the Gnostic Sanctuary Mansion on the Sim Silent, that's for those who don't know, it's on the other side of the same Sim. Tuesday, June 29, 1 p.m., Second Lifetime, voice one and a half, one and a half hours, wow. Uh, question and answers. Uh, discussion among attendees is very welcome. Interesting that you should mention Alistair Crowley Graza. Uh, I just I just recently uh, given a, a talk on Alistair Crowley over at the Gnostic Sanctuary, which I'd be happy to repeat. Or you can also find it online if you're interested in, in knowing the URL. I don't have it offhand, but if you message me, I am me, and I'll send you the URL for it online. Uh, I've also given a talk on Blavatsky as well over at the Gnostic Sanctuary. Uh, Blava uh, it's the Secret Doctrine of H.P. Blavatsky. Four one-hour talks on that. And the AA, the Crowley talk was, uh, an, uh, was it an hour, yes, or an hour and a half? I've forgotten. I think it was an hour. Okay, so I'll send, or an hour and a half. Okay, I've forgotten already. So... Uh, I'll send you those links, Graza, and we'll probably be repeating those talks in the future as well. Any other comments, questions, or discussion before we conclude with the dedication of merit, whereby we dedicate the merit of this talk to all beings? And while you're thinking about that, I'll pull it up since I have yet to memorize it. So I'll be returning next week. If you want to see what the schedule of talks here at Dharmata is, if you go into the basement of this building, there's a, uh, a greeter down there. I believe if you click it, you'll be offered a, uh, a note card about the group. And at the bottom of the note card, uh, there is a, uh, a, a schedule of uh, the series of talks, which we are coming to the end of, but we'll be repeating um, the talks as well. Um, 
I think we have one or two left that we'll be repeating the series as well, possibly in a somewhat modified form. Grasso says, I've eventually found like-minded peeps. You are very welcome. Yeah. So let's do the Dication of Merit. Feel free to join me in this. Whatever understanding, whatever positive force has come from this, may it go deeper and deeper as act, and act as a cause to reach enlightenment for the benefit of all. As always, thank you uh, once again for this opportunity to discuss Dharma. It is my pleasure and privilege. Uh, namaskar. And for those of you who are new to the sim, please feel free to wander around, take a look at what we've done. Namaskar.